I think it's no controversial statement to say that Nintendo is the oddest of odd ducks when it comes to the gaming industry. They're a company of contrast. They're forward thinking in some ways and quite backwards in other ways. Like on one hand, they made the Switch, a simple but genius bit of tech innovation. But on the other hand, you have their online systems. Just all of it. From the beginning. And their tendency to be an odd duck living in their own little world is a bit of a mixed blessing because it means that they can avoid some of the pitfalls that a lot of modern game companies fall into, but on the other hand, they have pitfalls all their own. And hey, the modern gaming industry has a lot of upside lest we forget, and Nintendo tends not to take advantage of these positive steps forward either. This is always kind of how it's been. As the medium has progressed, they've always just done their own thing, for better or worse. Their insularity and unique philosophy towards game design has resulted in most of their games having a distinct flavor that carries over from franchise to franchise. A formula that's always distinctly Nintendo. So that raises the question of, what would a lot of these Nintendo franchises look like in the hands of other developers? But before I get into that, I need to clear up the question of what constitutes being third-party developed in this case. I mean, objectively speaking, first party is full affiliation, second party is partial affiliation, and third party is no affiliation, but objective value can only be measured to a point. Creative works are always subjective, and I think this even goes for something like this. I mean, Retro Studios is owned by Nintendo, so they are a first party company, and everything they make is a first party game, but what about Intelligent Systems, or HAL Laboratory? Technically both are third-party companies, but they work exclusively with Nintendo on Nintendo IP. So from a subjective point of view, are their games first-party, second-party, third-party? There's a debate to be made for all three. Or what about Rareware? Technically they were a second-party company in the 90s because Nintendo had a partial stake in them. They had a rare stake if you will. But they also made extensive amounts of their own IP, which they themselves owned, and they generally had full creative control over their own games. Then there are companies like Mercury Steam, which co-developed the recent 2D Metroid games. Does the fact that Nintendo co-developed it make it a first-party game, or is it second or third party? You see what I mean? I don't think there's any one right answer here. This is a nuanced topic with a lot of grey area, so where these various games fall I guess needs to be taken on a bit of a case-by-case -case basis. It ultimately comes down to the element of creative control. Is Nintendo just giving you free reign over their IP, or are they dictating all the major decisions? So back to the topic at hand, what would Nintendo IP look like if fully outsourced to other developers? Thankfully, we need not speculate. They're no stranger to outsourcing their IP every now and again. Like the Philips-Nintendo collaboration where we ended up with not one, but three awful Zelda games. Oh, and also Hotel Mario. And does Mario is Missing ring any bells? How about that Tingle game, or Pilot Wings Resort? Does anybody really care for Hey Pikmin? Or how about Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, a series played by millions, cared for by no one? Let's not get too hasty though. Mario Plus Rabbids is a recent example of another company, in this case Ubisoft, taking a Nintendo IP and making something that's not only really good, but also beautifully absurd. Mario with a gun, shooting Rabbids turn-based gameplay style. And then in the Zelda camp you have something like the Hyrule Warriors games by Omega Force and Team Ninja, an acquired taste which thankfully I have. And just as there are exceptions to third-party games not excelling, there are exceptions to the Nintendo formula, such as Breath of the Wild, a game that revolutionized the open-world genre. With that said, what exactly does Nintendo do that's so different compared to other developers? What is this Nintendo formula I speak of exactly? Well, the way I see it, and this is just my interpretation, it usually comes down to less story, more gameplay, an eye for detail, gameplay polish to a mirror shine, when in doubt, recycle, 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 but also innovate, 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 especially if it means doing something unique with the hardware. Don't rock the boat too much, every game should be functionally the same as the last, but always remember that if you're doing that, you should add one or more unique gameplay elements that can fit right into the core experience in order to differentiate sequels. Here's the thing though. The Nintendo formula is not generally a bad thing. There are some franchises that absolutely prosper with this design philosophy behind them. But I think there are franchises that are actively stifled by Nintendo's creative approach, and I think none more so than Star Fox. As a series, Star Fox has had pretty much more non-first party representation per capita than any other Nintendo franchise. So we've seen both sides of the fence. We've seen what could be in the hands of others, and what is in the hands of Nintendo, and the stifling thereof. In all, we have seven games, one remake, and whatever the hell Star Fox Guard is. 
And of the main series, there were three games that were made by other companies, those being Star Fox Adventures by Rareware, Star Fox Assault by Namco, and Star Fox Command by Q Games. Although that last one is a bit of a gray area, because it definitely feels like Nintendo didn't have much of a hand in making it, but according to Wikipedia, Nintendo EAD was involved somehow. Also, I'm sure you'll say, weren't Star Fox 1 and 2 made by Argonaut Software? Well, that's only partially true. It was a co-development between Nintendo EAD and Argonaut Software. Plus, Shigeru Miyamoto was lead designer and producer. Can't get much more Nintendo than that. God, the amount of things I've had to preface with this video makes me wonder if it was even worth making. Either way, the gulf in approaches between Nintendo and third-party companies becomes almost jarringly vast when you examine it. With the non-first-party games you have, for one, a Zelda clone, for two, an on-rails slash third-person shooter action-adventure hybrid, and for three, a turn-based flight sim action combat hybrid. <laughs> well, that's certainly a mouthful. Then on the Nintendo side you have Star Fox, a remake of Star Fox, and a glorified remake of Star Fox 64, which is on top of the actual remake of Star Fox 64. And also Star Fox 2 is there, but I don't know if we count it because it was released over 20 years after it was intended to come out. On the third party side, no two games are exactly alike. They wildly vary in quality, yes, but you also never know what you're gonna get. So that's kind of the gulf between Nintendo and third parties in a nutshell. You have safe but formulaic with Nintendo, and then when other companies are given free reign, the games are experimental but inconsistent. But the fact is, I think that in the case of Star Fox, experimentation should be the way to go. I really like the traditional Star Fox gameplay, but it's such a rigid gameplay style that there are very few ways to really mix it up without changing the gameplay at a fundamental level. There's only so many ways you can shoot a thing on rails before everything blurs together. Mario-style platforming, Zelda-style action-adventure, these are styles of gameplay that are versatile enough that you can play around with any number of ideas without changing anything. But with Star Fox, attempting to branch out into more versatile gameplay styles and combining that with the traditional gameplay is really the only way to expand on the core concepts of the series. Was Star Fox Adventures the way to go? Was Star Fox Command the way to go? Maybe, maybe not. That's what experimentation is all about. Star Fox Command is many things, f***ing stupid being among them, but it had some good ideas. The less said about the execution though, the better. Star Fox Adventures on the other hand is a pretty good Zelda clone if I'm being honest, and most of the common complaints I've seen about it are non-diegetic, i.e. quote, it's bad because it's not a Star Fox game despite having the Star Fox branding. Unquote. And I find that to be a bad faith argument. There's no end to ways that you can complain about what a game isn't, but to me, what something isn't doesn't matter. What it is, is all that should matter. And of course there's always going to be exceptions to this rule, and trust me, the absurdity of taking Star Fox and making it into a Zelda clone is not lost on me, nor are any of the game's flaws lost on me, but that doesn't make the game bad. It's enjoyable enough for what it is. Granted, it also wasn't supposed to be a Star Fox game originally, that was just Nintendo co-opting the game when they realized that the protagonist looked like Fox. But either way, the intention is irrelevant. The end result is all that matters, and the end result is that it's undisputedly a game in the Star Fox mythos. Then there's Star Fox Assault, which to me is the one example of the third-party Star Fox games that manages to integrate and expand on gameplay ideas to where it feels like a natural branching out of the Star Fox formula without feeling like it's trying to be a completely different game altogether. It experiments with what Star Fox can be, and ends up being a pretty solid game altogether. The ground combat that seamlessly transitions into R-Wing combat is something that feels like a natural extension of the previous games, so you can have that high-octane explosive action in the skies, but you're also able to have a more intimate combat setting where you can handle things on the ground level in frantic skirmishes. You have levels of top-tier classic shooting action, and you have levels of multi-terrain combat, a balance that keeps things fresh and provides you with the gameplay that you want, as well as surprising you with various gameplay elements that you didn't know you wanted. I think Star Fox Assault kind of represents the genesis of what could be Star Fox fully realized. That is, if they were allowed to continue building on these core concepts. It's not perfect. The on-ground segments have somewhat janky controls from an oversensitive aiming reticle, the movement feels quite slippery, and the smallness of some gameplay areas does make the flight a bit limiting, but at the end of the day it feels like the beginning of something that could have been great, but the Nintendo formula rarely allows for that level of evolution with a few exceptions. And now, we're so far removed from Assault, or even Command, that they might as well be in the Andromeda Galaxy. But it goes deeper than that. Star Fox Assault represents the current apex of what Star Fox gameplay can be, yes, but it's also in many other ways the ballsiest Star Fox game, possibly the ballsiest Nintendo game generally. It shakes up the status quo in ways that you'd assume would be... unthinkable. 
It's absolutely dark as hell and even kind of f***ed up at times. Two scenes in particular come to mind. The scene where Pigma fuses with a space station, becoming a Cronenbergian nightmare, and the other being when General Pepper's flagship appears completely taken over by an aperoid. Both very heavy, very dramatic story beats that have extremely mature and disturbing imagery. Then beyond that, there's the fantastic scene of story gameplay integration at the beginning of the game. You know, the scene that starts with Oikini, the fake-out first boss, being murked harder than Archduke Franz Ferdinand before it was shown that a single aperoid has the destructive power of a level boss. And after you defeat a single one, it's shown that there's an entire army of equally powerful creatures, illustrating through gameplay alone the level of threat we're dealing with. Or how about the uneasy alliance between Star Fox and Star Wolf after the situation gets dire enough? You ain't gonna see that shit in Star Fox 64. There's a lot of interesting and compelling stuff here. A lot of attempts at much more mature themes and storytelling than Nintendo usually bothers with, which is laughable because this whole situation only really came about because Nintendo handed Star Fox off to Namco and basically said, go nuts. An attempt to shake the series to its core was only possible because the people who owned the series had little or nothing to do with it. How sad is that? Storytelling is something that Nintendo has always taken a less is more tact with, which has meant that things like Mario, Zelda, Metroid, Animal Crossing, etc, etc, etc can be evergreen, because without a constant character progression, you can focus on gameplay, and as long as you're always able to find unique twists for the gameplay, the various series never get stale. But my problem with Nintendo is that because of this, we've seen them constantly brush up against potentially compelling storylines, but in an effort to not rock the boat too much, they never capitalize. Let's take Link's Awakening for example. Somewhere in Link's Awakening, there's a plot about a man selfishly embarking on a quest to destroy an entire civilization for reasons that will benefit him and only him where the enemies you fight are just trying to maintain their own existence. There's a gold mine of potential moral ambiguity. Who's the real monster and all that? Then there's the subplot about Marin and Link possibly having a thing with each other. You'd think these two plots are building to some conflicting feelings where the main character wonders if he'll have a better life on the island, but not for Nintendo. It let all of these intriguing elements die off as they told a largely minimal story with black and white morals. Of course, as always, there are exceptions to this rule, most of them being part of the Zelda series coincidentally, but this philosophy is why whenever Nintendo makes a Star Fox game, it tends to run on a template. That template being Star Fox 64, which itself furthermore equates to, let's just remake Star Fox on the SNES again. Of course, there's only been four examples of this, but that encapsulates the entire Nintendo Star Fox output with the exception of Star Fox 2, so they haven't exactly done anything to prove me wrong. Oh yeah, they'll change some things, but the broad strokes are always the same, and quite frankly, a hundred Andross boss fights or monologues about James McCloud's death aren't going to be as compelling to me as the one scene where General Pepper can't even control his own body. And hey, Star Fox Adventures may have been B-movie bad at times, and Star Fox Command may have been written like nine different poorly written fanfictions, but at least they tried to do something different. Is it better to try and fail or to have never tried at all? To be able to actually branch out and experiment with the formula, you occasionally end up with really good games like Star Fox Assault, but sticking to the Nintendo formula of just playing it safe and making the same game with minor changes, at least with this series, you end up with something like Star Fox Zero. Oh my goodness gracious me, Star Fox Zero. What a terribly misguided game that was. It should be mentioned that Star Fox Zero is technically third party as it was made by Platinum Games, however it was co-developed by Nintendo EPD and it was very heavily publicized that Shigeru Miyamoto himself had a very heavy hand in the game's direction. So Star Fox Zero is for all intents and purposes first party developed, which you can really tell by playing the game. I ultimately kinda like Star Fox Zero, it's not my least favorite game in the series, but it's easily the one that makes me the most sad and angry. Sangry? because it represents the tragic direction of the series. It's a case where Nintendo was simultaneously playing it way too safe on the story front, as well as playing it too safe on the core moment-to-moment -moment gameplay front. Well, except for... <laughs> actually, we'll hold that thought. So it was a big middle finger to the people who were invested in the ongoing story arc by starting from square one and being a glorified retread of Star Fox 64. Then it was also a big middle finger to the people who wanted the series to evolve on a gameplay front by devolving back to 1998 gameplay in 2016. But it was simultaneously a middle finger to the people who just wanted some classic Star Fox gameplay by including shoehorned gimmick after shoehorned gimmick that each controlled worse than the last. They seemingly wanted to include every bad Wii U gimmick in existence, which by the way, nobody asked for. So Star Fox Zero was essentially the worst of both worlds and satisfied no one. The first Star Fox game in almost a decade at that point, and this is what we got. Now, I know I said just a minute ago that experimentation should be the way to go with Star Fox. 
The problem with Star Fox Zero is that it was the wrong type of experimentation. I want gameplay experimentation. These were just bad gimmicks. If I say I'm hungry, that doesn't mean I want a pie thrown in my face. There are a few neat ideas, the walker springs to mind, although that was in Star Fox 2 first, and like other Nintendo games, they do scrape up against some intrigues, like when Wolf implies that he had a history with James McCloud before he died, but once again, that was left unfulfilled. Through the good and the bad of Star Fox Zero, it was a tacit confirmation that the only worthwhile thing Nintendo sees in Star Fox is the same game we've played multiple times already, Star Fox 64. That's the only thing they could be sure people actually like, and that's so sad. To be fair, Star Fox 64 is a great game. In fact, it's one of my favorite N64 games going all the way back to when I first played it. It's one of those fast, frantic arcade games that you can pick up and play anytime and never get tired of. That said, I don't want the same game over and over, and the series has shown that it has so much more to offer if you ask me. And that's the tragedy of Star Fox. The people who own the franchise seem to be the ones least interested in actually doing anything daring with it. Nintendo seems content just making the same game over and over and over again. No weight, no nuance, no intrigue, no evolution, no significant gameplay expansion, nothing. I think the series is capable of a Mass Effect level epic, but the series will likely never be able to reach its fullest potential, whatever that may be. And at time of writing, Star Fox Zero is the last new Star Fox game unless you count Star Fox 2. So if their stance on the series has changed, well, they've done nothing to prove that to us. At the end of the day, being safe but formulaic may work for other franchises. As a matter of fact, some franchises thrive when they take the safe approach, but Star Fox being the same game over and over is seriously holding the series back and making the shelf life significantly shorter. Something the people holding the keys to the kingdom badly need to realize. But hey, in recent years, they've shown more willingness to break the molds that they themselves set, both from a storytelling perspective and from a gameplay perspective, so maybe the series' next major evolution is just around the corner. Or maybe it's just gonna be like another F-Zero, and we're never gonna see the series again after Star Fox Zero flopped like it did. I'm not crying, you are. And that is it from me. I've been the King of Snark Style, or the Monarch of Snark if you prefer, right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, saying what we want, when we want. Don't forget to like and subscribe, leave a comment telling me what you think, and hit the notification icon so you never miss out on my various escapades. Other than that, I will see you all next time. Peace.